The Mitsubishi Outlander has always been a good value family SUV proposition in Australia, but you would be forgiven for not really remembering much about it because, let's be honest, good value car but kind of forgettable as well. This new generation Mitsubishi Outlander looks to change that completely however. This is an all new model and it's got a new look on the inside and out. And when I mean all new, I do mean it. This is a new platform, new powertrain, new interior, a lot more safety and tech going on inside as well. So today I want to run you through everything you need to know about this new Mitsubishi Outlander. I will take it for a drive, see what this new powertrain, CVT automatic gearbox is like, but firstly, the interior. There is a lot to get through. This is exceed specification. There are a lot of trinkets going on and I'll run you through everything that you need to know. Also, this is a seven seat SUV and I had a quick look before. That third row is very tight. So I'm gonna be honest, I'm not sure if I'm actually gonna fit in there, but there's only one way to find out. So let's go have a look. The 2022 Outlander range kicks off at $34,490 for the two-wheel drive ES specification, and it goes up to $49,990 for the all-wheel drive Exceed Tourer. Both of those prices are before you factor in on-road costs. We've got the penultimate Exceed specification, which has an asking price of $47,990 before on-road costs. It's got most of the available goodies on board. Things like electric leather seats with memory, heating and lumbar support, a sunroof, three zone climate control, digital instrument cluster and heads up display and 20 inch wheels on the outside. The Outlander is also a seven seater in this specification, but has been described by Mitsubishi as more of a five plus two. That means that third row is designed more for occasional use overall. Like I said, this is an all new look for the Outlander. And I've got to say, in comparison to the previous generation, it's a lot more striking. And I think it's a bit better looking. You definitely get a few more heads turning with this model. Mitsubishi calls this design language dynamic shield. Now, I don't really know what that means, but you can see similarities between other models. I can see a bit of Triton going on here, a bit of Pajero Sport as well. You've got these narrow little DRLs here. Your main driving beams are actually this stack down here. You've got one of those on each side. And the cool thing is the Outlander has LEDs across the range. So the guys in the bottom of the spec don't get stuck with halogens. I do really like that. Moving around to the side here, this Exceed specification gets some pretty spiffy looking alloy wheels. They're 20 inch in diameter and they look pretty good I think and you've also got of course the cladding on the side here that is a very SUV thing but in terms of the overall size of the Outlander it's classed as a medium sized SUV but it kind of sits in between medium and large and I think that could be a really nice sweet spot for some buyers because you might not need something as big as something like a Kluger or a Sorento they are a large SUV this is somewhere in between the two it can still seat seven inside but it's a little bit smaller that helps price that helps maneuverability around town and that sort of thing and running costs so this could be a really good option. So this is the Exceed specification in the new Outlander. So you're looking at around $48,000 before on roads for one like you see it here. Now there is one spec above that now, that's called Exceed Tourer. That is more of a styling change over this one. This Exceed, as you see it, has all the bells and whistles. And I have to say for the money, there is a lot of that going on. I'll start here with this infotainment display. You might know that Mitsubishi and Nissan and Renault in fact have an alliance going. So they're sharing a lot of resources and a lot of development and you can see this here this is more of a Nissan style infotainment display I've got a volume knob there I've got buttons down the bottom there's Apple CarPlay there's native navigation there's Android Auto and there is digital radio and I have to say using this infotainment display over the last few days driving this car fantastic it's fast to respond there's no issues there and I haven't had any weird dropouts or anything like that it's all really good now moving further down here, you've got a design which is similar to many premium looking cars these days. The air vents integrated into the dashboard and you've got this sort of fill in panel here that sort of connects everything. That's very much a uh, in vogue thing at the moment. But I have to say overall, this Outlander looks and feels really nice. And especially when you look at the asking price, this is a solid offering. Further down, you've got dual zone climate control. Actually, it's three zone in this specification because we've got a separate one in the back there. There's a USB-C power outlet, USB and a wireless charging plug. And the 12 volt plug is still alive in this spec as well. That is handy to have when you're doing some road tripping. 
Now this is a different gear shifter for the Outlander. It's a little bit different to your normal lever. You actually grab it almost like a mouse or a puck off an air hockey table maybe, I'm not sure, but you grab it like this, you push the button and it actually slides forward and backwards to work. It's a bit different and, you know, the styling might not be to everyone's taste, but after using it for a little while, very easy to use, no problems there. Now just behind the gear shifter, you've got this driving mode dial here. There is a variety of modes, there's some off-road ones and some on-road ones. There's a few different things going on with this Mitsubishi. It's got all-wheel drive and their version of a traction control. It's called Super All-Wheel Control and it's actually pretty good, but I'll dig into that a little bit more when we're actually driving. Now one thing I want to point out about this Outlander is it's it is a premium take and when you compare it to the previous generation Outlander, this is leaps and bounds ahead of where it was. And it, it sort of signifies what a lot of manufacturers are doing this day. They're getting more premium, they're getting better design going on, there are nicer materials as well. Some of the materials maybe aren't as good as they could be. This has a lot of black piano plastic here and this thing already only had 500 kilometers on it when I picked it up but it's already starting to show some scratches. So after some hard use, things like bracelets, rings, just all that sort of stuff you tend to carry around, that might tarnish fairly quickly. And you've got a sort of stainless steel looking thing here. That is just plastic. You do have some hard plastics around the place, but mostly it's good. So you have to remember that this is a good value for money car, this Outlander, but it's not necessarily feeling like a cheap car. They've done a really good job of having a nice experience in this Outlander. First things first in the second row of this Outland, as you can see here, I've got plenty of legroom. That is my seating position up front there. I do sit a little bit close to the wheel perhaps, but even if I do slide this seat forward, there is still plenty of room left over. And that is an important point to make. This has a 60-40 split on the forward slide and you will be needing that if you're gonna be using the third row, which I will get to later. But another thing worth mentioning, the backrest does go a little bit forward and a little bit back. So you can get a little bit more comfortable there. But another thing to note, that is actually really handy for when you're putting child seats in. You can help get them in the right position, nice and firm against the seat. But when you've got adults in the back here, this is comfortable. The seating position is a little bit high in comparison to the front seat. So visibility is good. You've got nice big windows. If you don't want the sun, you've got blinds. That's a really nice touch. And you've got a big sunroof as well, but we did note something here. It's a small detail, but it is worth noting. This sunroof actually opens and the opening pane of glass slides underneath the fixed one. Normally they go over the top and we did a little bit of a test. Our camera guy got his hand caught in there because, you know, if you've got one of those kids that likes to experiment on things, just keep note that they might get their hand caught and it might hurt a little bit because it doesn't sense that and it doesn't stop. So just a little safety thing there. Other features we've got here, you've got air vents, you've got controls for the air vents as well. There isn't any fan speed control there, that's up front, but you can adjust the temperature. And along with the normal map pockets, you've got these handy little ones as well up high. That could be handy for something like a phone can go in there, a wallet, something like that. Works quite well. And if you've only got two in the back here, this centre bit folds down. It's actually got a 40-20-40 split on the backrest. This is a really nice armrest actually. You've got a couple of cup holders there. This does feel really comfortable. I could sit in here for a long journey and be quite happy. So I'll need you to use your imagination here for a moment. Up the front there, I'm gonna be driving this car. There's another version of me up there. I'm quite comfortable in my normal driving position. And behind that version of me, there is another version of me. And I'm sitting in the second row, and I've moved that seat forward just enough so I'm still comfortable. I've got enough leg room, but I'm freeing up a little bit of space in the back here. And then, poor old me right in the back. I kind of wish I didn't have breakfast this morning because maybe I would have fit a little bit better in here. This is, as you can see, extremely tight. Now I've got to give Mitsubishi a little bit of credit here because they call the Outlander actually a five plus two, not a true seven seater. And it does make sense and it still might work for some people I think. If you value a third row, you think it's a really important thing to have but you're not going to be using it all the time, this still might make sense for you. And if you've got, let's say, kids in the second row here, you can move those seats forward even more and make a bit more space in the back here. But maybe it's the kids you like 
the least we'll be getting in here because it is still extremely tight. All right, so I've moved that second row forward a lot more and now, at least physically, I do fit in the back here. I'm something like a bit under six foot, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I would say your average size human and although I do fit here, I've got literally no headroom and no legroom as you can see. And old mate in front of me now, he is hard up against that driver's seat as well. So this is definitely only suitable for kids in the back here. But for some people, it might work, I suppose. Other things in here, you do not have any air vents. You do not have any power outlets. You've got a small window. There's a little bit of visibility going on here and you've got cup holders as well. And well, you know what? I wouldn't want to be in the back here, but as a kid, I suppose you'd cop it. Now, if you don't need a third row and you prefer to have a little bit more boot space, consider a five seat option because that will effectively lower the floor of this boot and give you more space. But if you want to go full on van mode, pull these levers here. That folds almost flat, but not completely, but that gives you 1,473 litres of storage space. And if you're wondering where the spare wheel is, don't worry, it's hiding under here. In this Exceed specification, that's actually a subwoofer that's built in there, so you'd have to move that out of the way, but this is a space saver spare. Not as good as full size, I'll admit, but it's a lot better than a goo kit. Under the bonnet of our Outlander is an engine shared across the range. It's a 2.5 litre, four cylinder, naturally aspirated petrol engine. It's sourced from Mitsubishi's alliance partner Nissan, and it makes 135 kilowatts and 245 newton meters. And that's using regular 91 Ron unleaded petrol. Power runs through a CVT automatic gearbox and claimed fuel economy with an all wheel drive Outlander is 8.1 litres per 100 k's. The first important point to make about this Outlander is that it is actually the first product of the Nissan, Renault, Mitsubishi Alliance. Those three manufacturers are sharing platforms, sharing engines, sharing the development of new models. So this Outlander is in a way a sneak peek of what the new Nissan X-Trail will be like. There's a new platform under there which is shared by all of those manufacturers and the automatic gearbox is a CVT that's made by Jatco which is a company that has close relationships to Nissan as well. But that has all been tuned and the chassis has been tuned and the suspension has been done by Mitsubishi. The end product, regardless of all that, is really good. This is a car that is not trying to be some kind of performance car. It's got ample power and torque when you need it, and it's nicely responsive in terms of how it gets that power down to the ground. You can get cheaper variants of the Outlander with just front wheel drive, but we've got the all wheel drive version here, and it's got something called super all wheel control. It's the latest generation one for Mitsubishi, and it's an on-demand all wheel drive system. So most of the time, you're just powering the front wheels, but you can bring in the rears when you need it, going around corners, rough surfaces, low traction surfaces, that sort of thing. For the application of this car, which is, let's face it, a family car, first and foremost, this feels really good, nicely set up. It's not as light as some other cars in terms of electric steering, but it does have a really nice feel and it's just easy to drive around town. That is the most important thing for this car and I think it does it really well. We've got a bunch of driving modes here. There's Eco, there's Normal, and there's one called Tarmac, which is kind of like a dynamic mode, I suppose, that increases throttle response. It changes the gearbox calibration and that sort of thing. This thing does actually handle reasonably well. It's got this ability to rotate the car through corners by braking wheels when they're needed. That's part of that all-wheel control thing I mentioned before. But that's not the main thing about this car. It's about ride comfort, ease of driving, and it's got a great combination of comfort and road holding at the same time. And I think a lot of that has to do with this automatic transmission. It's a CVT, it's continuously variable, which is a little bit different to a normal torque converter automatic gearbox. These things have a little bit of a checkered reputation, but this is one of the better examples by far. I can think of Subaru, they do a really nice CVT these days, but this one isn't too far behind it. It's got a little bit of a stepped nature to it, so it doesn't feel like you're driving a big rubber band that's just revving the engine continuously all the time. It's got a nice, smooth, progressive feel, and it's responsive as well. You do have flappy paddles, which is pretty funny considering the gearbox doesn't have traditional gears, but it does lock into gear in a way. It locks into a ratio, I suppose, would be the technical way to say it. 
and it works. Even if you're going downhill, you can flop, knock the flappy paddles back into second and it will hold that gear and actually give you a bit of engine braking. I can tell you not all of them do that. And overall, in terms of performance, I think there is plenty enough here. Yes, it's not a fast car, nor is it trying to be, but for the purposes of driving around town, pulling into traffic, getting on the highway, you can stomp the pedal a little bit and it's responsive and fast enough to get the job done. And in terms of fuel economy, I'll just figure this out here on this nice digital instrument cluster. 468 kilometres I've driven in this car and that is averaging 9.0 litres per 100, which for a naturally aspirated petrol engine is pretty good. Naturally, it is also going to be beaten by hybrids, it's especially Toyota closed loop hybrids. They're going to be using nearly half the amount of fuel as this does and turbo diesels will have it beaten as well. But for what it is, I think it's pretty good. Now, while I'm digging through this digital cluster here, there is one minor point which I think is a great one for this Outlander. It's to do with the active driving aids. It's got lane keep assist, it's got lane departure warning, all those things, but there is a button there that helps tune the sensitivity of those items. And you can turn it down to mild, you can turn it right up to wild, and it does change how it reacts, and that will suit drivers quite well. I'm not the biggest fan of that technology, especially when it just gets in the way of normal driving. But the good thing about this Outlander is that it doesn't really do that and you can modify it to suit your own tastes. That's a really good detail. Mitsubishi's five year, 100,000 kilometer warranty doubles to 10 years and 200,000 Ks, provided that you keep your Outlander service through Mitsubishi's own dealership network. Servicing is cheap as well with a capped price 10 year program. It costs only $995 after five years and $3,190 after the full 10 years. Please give us a thumbs up if you found this video helpful and let us know in the comments. Do you have anything you want to say about this car or do you have any more questions? Hit us up in the comments below and we'll try to get back to you. And of course, subscribe to drive.com.au on YouTube and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out on future videos. Now, what is the verdict on this Outlander? I really like it. It's better than the previous generation and it's caught up in many respects like technology and safety. But for me, it's still a really good value for money proposition. This is one of the cheapest seven seat SUVs you can get, but it's far from the worst. It's actually really well executed overall. And I think this will really fit a sweet spot for a lot of Australian families. If you want another option for a seven seat SUV that is similar money to this Outlander Exceed, check out this review up here. It's by my colleague Justin and he runs through a base grade Kia Sorento. Now that's a seven seater, but it's a bit bigger and it has a few less bells and whistles than this one.